In cities across America, it is not uncommon for murders to go unsolved for years, sometimes even decades. And in Boston, the problem is on full display. More than 1,300 murder cases have gone cold in Suffolk County, dating back to the 1960s, with victims of color facing the worst odds. According to a recent study from the Washington Post, Boston has the biggest gap of any U.S. city, with police solving an average of twice as many murder cases with white victims as cases where the victims are black. It's a problem Manapan mother Connie Mahogany Payne knows all too well after both her sons were shot and killed. 22-year-old Rashad in 2008, 18-year-old Lloyd in 2010. To date, both of their murders remain unsolved, and Payne said back in April that eventually police stopped communicating with her and her family altogether. I feel more angry with them than I do who shot my children because I feel like they leave us hanging. Even with the Boston Marathon, with the school shootings, like everybody's lives matter besides our children who's dying right here on these streets of Boston. But their cases and others like them could soon be getting a second look as part of a new initiative from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. It's called uh, the Project for Unsolved Suffolk Homicides, or PUSH. DA Rachel Rollins joins me now. Good to see you, DA. Thanks for you being as here. You well. Why are you doing this? First in the nation, from what I understand. Why are you doing this? Yeah, for, for Mrs. Payne, for, for all of the Mrs. Paynes out there. I can't tell you, Jim, as a candidate campaigning, that was the most heart-wrenching thing when I would shake people's hands and they'd say, you never called me, the, the police never called me six, seven, 13, 15 years. Um, so we have to do something. I heard after you were elected, I read that you started calling the families of murder victims on the day of the anniversary of the person they love's death? So what I try to do now is I call um, every time a homicide comes in, I want to speak to the family and um, let them know, you know, sadly, these happened on my watch. Of course, I inherited the other ones, but we are going to be calling on the anniversaries and we're going to get a complete accounting of all of those 1,367. And why it's first in the nation, Jim, is Everyone in my office is invested in this, not just most DA's offices have one or two people in an unsolved unit. Mm -hmm. We are going to do an, a top-to-bottom top review. You know, uh, I, I mentioned this uh, brilliant study that Wes Lowry, formerly of The Globe, now The Washington Post, did uh, the, uh, the arrest rate for white victims in Boston, 90% since 2007, black victims, 42%. Was that part of the motivation here, the racial, grotesque racial disparity? Yeah, it was. I mean, reading that article was, was very... Uh, concerning, of course, but I've met with detectives, and what I can tell you, Jim, unfortunately is, or fortunately for white people, the number of white homicides in Suffolk County is significantly smaller than the number of black and brown mm -hmm. homicides, so it's a smaller percentage uh, that they're solving, and then also the big discrepancy is if a homicide happens inside as opposed to outside, but still these numbers are concerning. You know, uh, the good news here, and I think it's really good news, is that you will give hope to some people who didn't have it before. Sure. The bad news is it's going to be false hope in a lot of cases. You're not going to solve 1,367 murder cases going back to the 1960s. So what is the expectation? What do you tell people other than the fact, whatever words you used a minute ago, we're going to do a complete uh, relook at this thing? Sure. What we tell them is we remember your loved one. We are going to do everything in our power with new advances in, you know, uh, science and DNA, uh, if there's any way that we can have a fresh set of eyes looking at this. And what I'm committed to doing, and it's a high order, is all 1,367 in my first term, I want an administrative review and then an ADA looking at those cases. We can't get through those numbers, Jim, without having all of my staff, all 300 plus of them, actively involved. Yeah, I read, I think it was four days after you announced this, that the state cops, state police announced that you have a smile on your face. I just usually a, have a smile on my a face. A similar uh, uh, effort. What's the connection? What's the... I mean, you'd have to ask Colonel Gilpin, but I would hope that it's that when we see Mayor Walsh and Commissioner, Commissioner Gross doubling the size of their homicide unit inside of the Boston Police Department... Um, As part of this effort? Well... It happened a little bit prior to okay. me announcing, but we've yeah. been talking about yeah. this a lot. This is something I ran on, Jim. And what is great is when people put their money where their mouth is, other people listen and start acting accordingly. So we're excited. Whatever the reason for the colonel uh, making that determination, I don't care. We're just happy that the state police are involved as well. Do you have any expectation, even internally, our hope is we can solve 10% of these? Do you have any expectation? I have a higher expectation than that. I mean, look... 
you never want to say like, let's give one, well, let's see if we can solve 1%. I want to be a zealous advocate for these people that don't have a voice, for families to believe that we care enough to look into these cases. Um, I will not predict numbers, but I'm going to say I expect a, a thorough review um, and any, any potential lead will be tied down. Let's move to something else I know you feel strongly about, but so does the U.S. Attorney Andrew Lelling and the governor. Here is Lelling and Baker earlier in this year talking about safe injection sites. Andrew sure. Lelling and Governor Baker. I see no reason to support an effort to essentially normalize opioid use, which is what I think supervised injection sites do. These sites are currently illegal under federal law. The people who support them should be going to Congress in an effort to change the law. Until that happens, my office will enforce it. If people try to open up a safe injection site in Massachusetts, he will prosecute them. That puts the onus on us to chase alternatives that we can actually implement. First from Morning Edition, and the governor was on uh, Boston Public Radio. And by the way, since this, this what you considered, uh, 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 described as an historic turning point, case out of Philadelphia, sure. they've said virtually the same thing. Uh, Lulling has said they'll be met with federal enforcement, and Baker says a non-starter. Where are you going with this? What I'm saying is if the option is let's, not, let's do exactly what we're doing now with over 600 deaths, to date in Massachusetts, far more than that. Uh, by the way, Jim, one vaping death, three triple E deaths, or maybe four, and all of these opioid substance use disorder deaths. Um, if the option is no, let's do what we're doing now, or yes, let's move forward with some questions on something, I'm always a yes, number one. Number two, the governor nor the U.S. attorney are the ones getting the calls in the middle of the night from the state police and the Boston police about bodies that we're finding all over, the com all over Suffolk County. And remember, my county is where Mass and Cass is. I'm not sitting high on a hill somewhere. I'm there every day with the commissioner or with my state police unit when we get calls about bodies that we are finding as a result of this health crisis. By the way, Massachusetts Avenue, Melania Cass Boulevard, Methadone Mile, as some people describe it. But you have said, uh, and I may be paraphrasing, but you've essentially said, I'll take on Andrew Lelling if I have to. What does that mean? What, what, it, what, it, what I've said, and I've said it to the U.S. Attorney as well, we were both presenters at the Federalist Society, and I just said, look, I'm disappointed that the governor had an advisory committee that told him to move forward with safe consumption sites. The U.S. attorney says, I'll prosecute, and we buckle immediately. Nothing should be off the table. And now Philadelphia has said it does not violate the Federal Controlled Substance Act. And if that federal judge had said denied, U.S. Attorney Lelling would have said, see, Philadelphia tried it. And now he's trying to say there's appellate rights. It doesn't matter. I'm the one that's dealing with these families that are in massive crisis. We have to try everything possible. We need every tool in the tool belt. Uh, I want to move to something else also. WBUR did a report saying that there were 9,000 hours of overtime uh, by police at the so-called straight pride, absurd, offensive name rally, and not one body camera was on for one minute. The police explain it by saying, well, our policy is they should be on on regular shifts, but not on overtime. Is that acceptable policy? I would, I would hope that you'd ask the commissioner if he's here. But for me, what I can tell you is with respect to that parade, anyone that was violent was arraigned by our office, and the individuals that were um, exercising their First Amendment rights weren't. Uh, just like we did with the ICE protesters in front of uh, Sheriff Tompkins' facility, uh, who he has now turned his position regarding ICE. So it, it is not helpful, I will say, when we don't have body cam footage, and I hope the Boston City Council is going to be talking about that. We're going to do one more uh, move here, if we can. And, and this question is not directed at you as the district attorney. It's directed to you as a person who lives in this country. Okay. I know they're Jeez. not necessarily. As a human being, go Here ahead. is a tweet from the President of the United States this morning. Trump, uh, uh, so someday if a Democrat becomes president and the Republicans win the House, even by a tiny margin, they can impeach a president without due process or fairness or any legal rights. All Republicans must remember what they're witnessing here, a lynching. But we will win. And then here's what Senator Lindsey Graham had to say about Trump's tweet. This is a lynching in every sense. This is un-American. When I heard this, I have to say, uh, I did what I naively do quite often, is I can't believe he went there and said this, but then I've said that so many times. What's your reaction 
to him describing himself as being the victim of a lynching. Well, this is where we are right now. It's offensive, right? And what I can tell you is having just come back from uh, Alabama and um, – and go, gone to the lynching museum, to the museum. Um, and gonna, I'm going to be uh, listening to Brian Stevenson on mm -hmm. this Friday. Um, it's offensive to real families that have actually been terrorized by this country um, and have, have exhibited or, or had to endure real lynching. This fictional stuff, it's offensive. I've only, I have 30 seconds left. I, I've read a lot about it. What was the museum, what was that experience like for you? It, it was, um, it was life-changing in the sense that it reinvigorated me as to why I want to do this job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are poor people uh, and people of color, in particular black and brown people. We just need advocates. We need people that are going to um, be really qualified but very vocal about all of the injustice there. So I'm invigorated, so everyone be, be worried. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel Rollins, good to see you. Take care. I'm worried, yeah. by the way.